Okay, so um, may I? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, you may. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. I'm really delighted uh, to be here or there or somewhere with you. Uh, yeah, yeah, so um, I'm Monika Stobiecka. I'm an assistant professor at the Faculty of Artes Liberales, University of Warsaw. I'm an art historian and archaeologist, and um, I think that I should introduce a bit uh, my previous experiences with digital archaeology because uh, my papers are mostly theoretical, but I have also practical experience with investigating um, uh, investigating uh, archaeological uh, archaeological heritage with uh, with digital methods. In 2014, I was granted um, a student grant from the Ministry of uh, Science and Higher Education in Poland, and I was able to start a collaboration with a GIS specialist, a photogrammetry specialist, and a digital uh, reconstruction scholar. And we worked together uh, for two years. Uh, it was my first experience with digital archaeology, and I must say that um, back then I also started attending conferences on digital archaeology mostly in Poland and what I noticed was actually a kind of strange approach where scholars were mostly discussing how to develop the skills how to create more and more data and I, I had the feeling that everything was about the amount of data not really about the quality of data in 2015, I started my PhD research that was devoted to archaeological museums and uh, and fully awarely, I, I decided not to deal with Polish archaeological museums uh, because I, I encountered very spe specific approach to, to archaeological heritage in Poland. Uh, so to say many museums were deploying a lot of multimedia uh, in, in, uh, in galleries on exhibitions and my first thought was that this and the fact that scholars were focused on the on the on the on the data production this is actually something particular particularly Polish that can be somehow connected to the fact that that uh, a kind of tech Technocracy is now very present in the country. Uh, the ruling party of, of law and, and just, justice is, is promote, promoting very extensive digitization, technological development. And I was sure that this is something very particular for Poland. This kind of, this kind of I would say, for, uh, this kind of uh, delight with technologies. Uh, and assuming that I'm somehow grounded in this epistemic province, uh, this is my favorite expression used by Eva Domańska, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 identifying Poland as, as epistemic province, I thought that I, I, I should confront my experiences from Poland with uh, international, uh, international uh, scholarly uh, community. So I started to attend conferences uh, in Europe and in the US and actually nothing changed. So uh, once again I saw the same problems, uh, the priority was very often given to uh, skills, to, to data, to data production basically uh, and I couldn't find uh, this, 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 this kind of uh, theoretical sensibility, uh, this theory informed approach in digital archaeology. In 2018 I coined the term uh, digital escapism and back then I was able to go to Stanford Archaeology Center and, uh, and conduct another research uh, entitled Can Digital Archaeology Save the Past? And today I'm going uh, to talk about this particular project uh, that was supervised by Ian Hodder and uh, this will be uh, the case of the of the Syrian arch uh, replica that was also that was also discussed with scholars um, uh, specialized in, in uh, post-colonial studies. Uh, so uh, I will just jump into the presentation now. 
the switch from analog to digital in archaeology and a visible shift of focus uh, from destructive practices characteristic for um, of traditional academic archaeology to non-invasive digital and cyber interventions contributed to the development of digital and cyber rescue archaeology. Digital and cyber archaeologies generate immense data on the endangered heritage, create databases and alternative forms of digital heritage, propose new working patterns for the protection and preservation of archaeological monuments and sites. Complex technological tools and expanding uh, computer-based skills are being gathered together in new institutional frameworks. Numerous actions are undertaken daily, monthly, yearly to protect and preserve heritage for future generations. For those reasons, digital archaeologists claim that their practices have proven to be an important tool for mediating conflict, ensuring that the digital turn in archaeology entails engaging in current political issues. This declaration can be questioned while analyzing a copy of the Syrian Arch of Triumph. The original was destroyed in 2015. A year later, a copy was carved out of Egyptian marble. The replica was constructed thanks to the digital documentation, which allowed archaeologists to create a 3D model. The new arch was placed in various Western locations. However, it never reached Syria. This digital material artifact happened to be only a technological stand, missing important elements of theoretical background. Throughout my presentation, the replica of the Syrian arch will exemplify what happens when digital, digital practice is not theoretically informed. I will start with some general remarks on the place of theory within digital heritage practice. Then I will discuss uh, the Syrian arch copy and its imperial ground tour. Finally, I will present conclusions drawing attention to the role of theory in digital practice. The total metamorphosis undergone by archaeology in recent years has not equipped the discipline with new theoretical frameworks applicable to digital workflows. While researchers in the digital and cyber fields have announced the dawn of digital culture or digital ecosystems, the significant shift in data gathering, data representation, and the afterlife of digital, virtual, and cyber imagery has not yet inspired new theoretical understandings of these advances. Rapidly developing technologies should create open fora for, for the co-production of pasts that matter now and for visions of future communi community, as Michael Shanks uh, uh, put it. Yet one rarely encounters this reflexive approach, despite examples of best practices uh, coming from world-leading archaeological sites like Chatalhik, Pompeii, and Silchester. Researchers at the archaeological site of Chatalhik have recognized the widespread use of digital technologies in archaeology. However, their focus on the application of digital methods is intended not, to, not only to increase the accuracy and detail of the recording methods, but also, also to further reflexive aims defined in general terms as the situating of recording within its social and interpretative context. This kind of digital consciousness is generally rare across the discipline and throughout diverse archaeological projects. Scholars have noted this critical lack, which can lead to alarming forms of techno-optimism or even techno-fetishism. Jeremy Hugge, the prominent figure in digital archaeological theory, has argued that currently this area is under-theorized, underrepresented, and undervalued. Yet it is increasingly fundamental to the way in which we arrive at an understanding of the past. His calls for a meaningful dialogue about the intervening digital technologies and their influence on the outputs have gone almost unanswered. Huguet emphasizes that out of all the humanities, archaeology is in the best position to investigate and understand the implications, transformations, and repercussions of digital 
digital technologies. However, this rarely happens. The reason may lie in techno-fetishism and technocracy, as many have suggested, but also in digital culture itself. As Roberto Simanowski points out in his book on the seduction and betrayal of digital technologies, the general absence of a coherent theory in digital studies is striking. Digital te uh, technologies are mostly concerned with methods and skills, and this approach has led some to accuse digital archaeology of, quote, <laughs> of being technocratic, apolitical, and indifferent to social and cultural concerns, and of relating poorly with theoretical orientations currently found in archaeology, giving rise to an anxiety discourse that considers uh, it under-theorized and casts doubts on the value of its broader theoretical import. It seems that even today, the general goal of digital archaeology is to master technologies and protect contemporary archaeology's stronghold in academia by placing the discipline of things at the intersection of humanities, science, and social sciences. This attempt at interdisciplinary research often results in superficial uh, theoretical engagement. When the field focuses solely on the development and application of technologies, data production, or technological showcases in a museum, it lacks strong links to social, scientific, and cultural theories. The dream of rationalizing and objectivizing archaeology, an echo of the discipline's former processual approaches, so to say processualism 2.0, places digital archaeological practices outside the domain of theoretical reflection. Therefore, I would identify digital archaeology's main shortcoming as its disconnection from the broader horizon of archaeological theory, critical heritage studies, and critical museum studies, not to mention the overlooked impact of science and technology studies. A showcase example of what happens when there is no theory framing the digital practice is provided by the infamous copy of the Syrian art recreated by the Institute for Digital Archaeology in 2016. The original, so the Arch of Triumph or the Arch of Septimius Severus, was a Roman ornamental archway in Palmyra, Syria. It was built in 3rd century AD during the reign of the Emperor Septimius Severus as an imperial marker of the Roman domination in the province. During ancient times, the Syrian arch, together with hundreds of other arch monuments constructed across the Roman provinces, represented the powerful impact of Roman conquests and marked the geopolitical borders of empire. Read from today's perspective, the Syrian arch was a sign of colonial dominance and imperial powers um, that resonated throughout the history of architecture, while arches of similar political message reappeared in the Renaissance and in the 18th and 19th centuries. As a part of urban architecture of an ancient city, it was widely appreciated and became one of the touristic emblems of Palmyra. Thanks to archaeological missions, it was scrupulously documented, which turned out to be be invaluable when the arch was intentionally destroyed by the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant in 2015. Almost a year after this dramatic event, the Institute for Digital Archaeology created a reduced scale copy of the arch. It was brought into life thanks to the digital technologies. No hands were needed to carve out the elements of the arch in Egyptian marble. The work was delegated to multiple technological agents, computers, software, models, machinery. And here is a short video I would like to show you. Um, um, can you see it? Or it's not visible? No, it's not visible. Okay. Um, New share. Ah, okay. New share. Okay. Okay. Now. Okay. So now you should see it, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Perfect. Okay, uh, you can see my presentation now, yes? Visible? Yes, it's visible, right? The, the presentation now. Yes, it's visible. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so so as you have seen, the uh, th this was the video uh, presenting the production of the arc arch. Uh, so um, even though we we had those computer software models machinery, the uh, effect of those intensive digital works was material, a tangible, touchable, solid, 11 ton weighted copy of an arch that soon after it was created started an international ground tour. Uh, already in 2016, uh, the replica was set up at the Trafalgar Square, uh, London. A few months later, in September 2016, the arch traveled overseas to New York City, where it was placed at the City Hall Park. In February 2017, the copy of the arch was welcomed in Dubai at the World Government Summit. The arch traveled to Italy for one month at the end of March 2017. It was an important landmark in Florence, where the G7 summit had taken place. At the end of April 2017, uh, the arch was moved to Arona, Italy, where it was presented at the opening of a museum named after Khaled al-Assad, the Syrian archaeologist and curator of the Palmyra Museum, who lost his life during the dramatic events at the archaeological site of Palmyra. The next stop of the arch tour was Washington, D.C., where it was exhibited in, in September 2018. In 2019, the copy was moved to Switzerland. It was exhibited in Geneva in April during the commemoration of the 20 years of the second protocol to the Hague Convention. And later on, it was presented in Bern in June during the 70th anniversary of Switzerland's commitment to the UNESCO. Until now, the last stop in the Arts Grand Tour was Nimeister Abbey in Luxembourg in December 2019, when, uh, when the Arch stood to mark uh, Luxembourg's quarter century of the UNESCO membership. From its very beginnings, uh, the Arch raised multiple questions and controversies. Most of them were summed up by a British archaeologist, Zina Kamash, who conducted a related project at the same time when the replica of the arch was presented in London. Kamash po a project uh, called Postcards to Palmyra was a public archaeology initiative that invited people to write postcards about the copy of the arch when it was exhibited in London. Kamash gathered a great number of interesting materials which showed that more than a half of responses were positive about the replica. The rest, 22% expressed mixed uh, or negative 18% uh, um, feelings. Uh, Kamash analyzed the main fields of concern that could be summed up as the aim of the replica, technology, information, and set. The first thought-provoking and problematic issue related to the replica appears while reading the Western press news. 
At the same time, the art store was not widely commented by the Syrian press. The Syrian Arab News Agency mentioned only the first showcase of the replica in London, posting merely a YouTube link. Similarly, the Middle East Monitor dedicated only a six-sentence mention to the first display of the replica. The rest of the showcases were not commented. What was central for the news I read was rather the, the reopening of the site of of Palmyra for tourists. A Syrian Arab uh, news agency presented 17 press releases only from the 2019. Western press, on the other hand, devoted a lot of notices to the first and second showcase of the replica. However, multiple articles did not provide the comprehensive information on how exactly the copy was created. Kamash comments on this issue and emphasizes that, contrary to how mm, the news media presented this story, the replica was not printed on a 3D printer. The, talk, the technological information was barely understood by journalists and the public at large. However, it is worth stressing that almost all of the popular press articles informing about the replica of the Syrian arch were strongly techno-optimistic and techno-enthusiastic. The replica itself was prepared through state-of-the-art 3D technology. This technological method consists of creating a 3D model in a dedicated software from a 3D scan. Then an algorithm cuts the model into 2D slices, which are printed one after another. As Kamaj explains, the replica was machine cut from a block of marble using a digital model as the, the, uh, as the template. template. In this case, uh, that the importance of advanced digital technologies in the creation of the replica was strongly exaggerated due to the misunderstanding and, or maybe or, the lack of information. The Institute for Digital Archaeology did not provide information on technology, neither on makers, funders, and the actual cost of the arch when it was exhibited in London or elsewhere, what was criticized by Zina Kamar, Stuart Birch, Roshni Gunti, and the Factum Foundation. And this is very interesting uh, material created by the Factum Foundation. I really recommend visiting their website because they, they really paid attention to the details of, of the arch uh, uh, replica. So you can see exactly uh, where, where the mistakes were made, so to say. Uh, the accusations addressed at replica being a grotesque to champion ready-made, that is the fulfillment of Isis's wishes, or disnaificated, unethical, and unjust towards what happened to Syrians, were not isolated voices of disapproval. I heard similar opinions at the Digital Heritage Congress in 2018 in San Francisco. The case of the Syrian arch appeared several times during the debate. Uh, the debate, mostly in the ethical context concerning the monetization of heritage, data flows, and copyrights. The problem of the data used to create a 3D model turned out to be especially enigmatic. During the discussions in San Francisco, archaeologists and digital specialists mentioned that the Institute for Digital Archaeology copyrighted the replica of the arch. This, of course, undermines the rules of free data flows, as accessibility, and moreover, the idea of public universal heritage. Participants of the conference shared other experiences with the ARCH and its makers, st stating that the Institute for Digital Archaeology did not share the data. As an above-mentioned problem, this also runs contrary to the unspoken rules of the digital revolution, which are open access, open source, and transparency. Rajni Kunti resolved part of those doubts, uh, explaining that the Million Image Database project launched by the Institute of Digital for Digital Archaeology to gather more photos of the arch was a voluntary work of people who risked their lives to capture the rubbles of the arch. Kunti knows the blasé attitude of the Institute for Digital Archaeology, whose acts in this case could potentially endanger lives. Those debates 
placed somewhere between capitalization, politicization of heritage and digital ethics, encouraged me to personally contact the Institute for Digital Archaeology. Noting the sparse communication of the uh, Institute for Digital Archaeology executives on the official website and Twitter, I could not find answers for questions that bothered me and were related to widely understood agency of the replica itself. I was able to get in touch with a representative uh, with, with a representative secretary after submitting a message on the official website of, of the Institute for Digital Archaeology. Um, I received an answer stating, uh, stating that I would be contacted with uh, the director of technology, uh, Alexi Karenowska, but unfortunately I was left with no further answer. The questions that I sent, uh, hoping that they would be forwarded to Karenowska, touched upon the issues of data. Namely, I wanted to ask if they were using only their own data, data on Creative Commons licenses or all other open licenses. I wanted to know if the data was from international databases or maybe there was an exchange of the data because many, many archaeological missions were working in Palmyra uh, for many decades. So there was actually a lot of of material. Then I wanted to ask about the replicas grand, to uh, grand tour. So I wanted to know if the arch is being rented by different agendas, who is the, who is the so to say, owner of the arch, what is the legal status of the, of the arch, and who makes the decisions about uh, its future destinations. And finally, I wanted to know if the arch uh, was going to be exhibited in Syria. The last question that I wanted to pose to the staff working at the Institute for Digital Archaeology is of particular importance to this presentation. It is not only the question of the final destination, but rather a question of multi-speciality, locations that go with specific politics and cultural settings. Going back to the beginnings of the controversial copy, one should notice that the Syrian arts copy was created as a compensatory replacement, a symbol of the lost heritage and serious implications of terrorism. However, the first question that comes to my mind is, who is actually mourning after this loss? As the list of locations where the replica was set suggests, it was the West that felt the most touched by this heritage catastrophe. A Roman archaeological site was destroyed in the course of a terrorist act. So the West reacted with powerful technologies to revive the treasure of the universal heritage. Technologies were deployed to create a compensation for the West and in the West. Here, there are no Syrians struggling with war, migrating, losing their families, belongings, and finally, their lives. The replica of the arch is neither about the Syrian war, nor about Syrian losses, never about Syrian heritage. The copy was not created for Syrians as a replacement, as a compensation, or as a sign of an active disagreement. As the ground tour, of the fake arch proofs, it was created by and for imperial powers to mourn, compensate, compensate and prove that heritage is not global. In this sense, the process of recreation re revives and recalls the original meaning of the real arch as a sign of imperial power. By reinvigorating the old Oriental myths, the West is reaffirming its interest in Middle East, so, and so it is creating a target for continued destruction of such sites by those wanting to act against the West. In this sense, the restoration of colonial legacy and colonial appropriation of Greco-Roman past shall be seen as a silent agreement for the neo-colonial oppression that affects in further conflicts. One would say, uh, quoting the postcards from Palmyra, uh, Zina Kamar's project, the Syrian arch is, uh, is coming home, but the home is not Syria. It was Rome, and now it's, it's the ancestor, the West. So to say heritage is Western, does not matter if then or, or now, 
and unfortunately civilized to once again quote uh, or paraphrase one of the comments left on the postcard to Palmera. The replica is a showcase example of the development of Western technologies. Alexander Stingl assumes in his extensive study that digital culture is the ex extension of the very bourgeois civil society that has constituted the global north. It is merely the extension of the coloniality of power and being. Stink connects globalization and digitization as two parallel processes that occurred after the World War II and strengthened the global primacy and dominance of the West. His study of biotechnologies shows that the other is currently being colonized by Western imperial technologies. The West has its skills and innovations machines and software. And thanks to them, it can dominate and conquer those who did not master such technologies. Information flows and technologies, or to simply put it, digital culture, contribute to the alienation of the other, the other's history, culture, and values. The media and messages are Western and prioritize the Western interests. Here it is also worth to recall Bernard Stiegler's notion of a pharmacon. Pharmacon means that technology can be a cure and a poison at the very same time. The West can then manifest its tra tragedy of losing the Syrian arch by funding the replica and its worldwide tour that does not even, uh, that does not even include Syria. The replica is once again not about people's tragedy and war, but about technological fetishism. Similarly, it recalls the technocratic policy of UNESCO, recently discussed by Elon Musk. Technical skills serve here as, a, as efficient tools of cultural imperialism. This kind of cultural imperialism is especially visible while reading the press releases entitled How 3D Printers Can Help Undo the Destruction of ISIS, the second one, 3D Printing to Preserve Heritage, Replica of Palmyra Arch Draws Millions of Visitors at Fourth Installation Stop in Arona, Italy, or the third one, uh, The New Monument Men Outsmart ISIS. While the first article presents technologies as a brand new powerful way, Happen, and there is a quote, ISIS may keep blowing up historical landmarks in the Middle East, but now technology is fighting back. Then later on, the military nomenclature is even more remarkable when we uh, read. In short, the terrorists can win. Um, the architects of the world, armed only with 3D cameras and 3D printers, won't let them. Here, once again, here, one can clearly see how the civilized West is striking back with technologies. After Mescal, it is worth to repeat the question, exactly who are the barbarians in the conflict? Lorna Jane Richardson and Simon Lindgren, while, while reflecting on the possibility of applying social theory to digital archeology, span point out that the deep social introspection and a critical reflexive approach in digital archaeology can bring to the discipline the understanding of relationships of power, dominance, and inequality. This kind of holistic approach to digital archaeological object was missing while introducing the replica of the Syrian arch to the different Western locations. Wherever. Okay, so. Um... Yes, so so I I stopped at 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 this at this point where where I said that this this kind of holistic approach to digital archaeological object was missing while introducing the replica of the Syrian arch to the different Western locations. Wherever it went, the copy was uh, an artifact of ideological discourse that conveyed direct political statements. So in London, the copy was said to be a symbol of solidarity with the people of Syria and a symbol of the fiancés of, of the barbarians who destroyed the original, serving to be a schizophrenic artifact at the schizophrenic Trafalgar Square. 
In New York, it became a powerful act of solidarity with all those hurt and lost in the war uh, in Syria, and a historic work of art exhibited to be admired by, the New, by New Yorkers. In Dubai, it was said to be an embodiment of tradition and high technology. In Florence, it was placed next to Michelangelo's masterpieces, David and Neptune. In Arona, it stood as a symbol of unity, optimism, and peace. In Washington DC, it meant to be a critical way to celebrate iconic pieces and keep them very much alive and present in our collective consciousness. It also symbolized the solidarity with people of Syria who have been subjected to such unimaginable horror by ISIS and the Assad regime. Indeed, solidarity is always clearly visible during the official political events driven by certain agendas. The last few European stops show even clearer the hypocrisy, in this case, hidden under the safe eggs of UNESCO. In Bern, the arch stood as a sign for human dignity mm, against ignorance to celebrate Switzerland's 70th anniversary of commitment to UNESCO. In the end, the Syrian arch was hijacked by imperial countries, civilized and possessed thanks to their powerful technological tools to finally become an artifact of ideological discourse. Of course, one can discuss the role of the West as a protector of world heritage, but the question that should be posed touches upon an ethical issue. Is it really necessary to say that the arts replica serves as a sign of solidarity with Syrians? Taking into consideration possible costs of production, like marble, software, machinery, human labor, and transportation, which are, of course, the overseas travels from Europe to the United States and to United Arab Emirates back and forth. It is really crucial then to ask how this artificial substitute of lost heritage could contribute to unity and solidarity with Syrians. Did it change anything? Did it push and encourage people to react? Or was it only a Disney toy that helped the West to, hold, to cover its hypocrisy and boast about new technologies that can fix those acts of barbarism? It seems that, replica, that this replica did not escape the danger described by Mescal while discussing heritage protection in Syria. I know, I know. She's like, I know. Someone wants to get See, question because I can hear someone speaking. Ah, okay. Sorry, we just had uh, uh, someone enter the room. Ah, okay, okay, <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, so um, so just the, the the quote from from Lynn Mescal's book, uh, Future in Ruins. Uh, the danger here is intervening in the rescue of purely material heritage of neoclassical antiquity for which Western nations consider themselves to be the legitimate inheritors while not fully addressing those living and dying through the ongoing conflict or the resultant refugee crisis. So given the discussion by Rajni Kunti, who emphasized that countries which welcomed the arch were also the ones that accepted a minimal number of refugees, uh, and it was the US, the UK, and the UAE in 2018, the arch stands as a technological curtain that covers the passiveness of Western countries to actively help the victims of the Syrian conflict. Thus, from the above quoted descriptions of, symbol, of symbols inscribed onto the replica of the Syrian arch, only one seems legitimate for me. This copy, as a matter of fact, is nothing more than an embodiment of tradition and high technology. Whereas tradition sends us back to the ownership of monuments and heritage, and high technology means new ways of translating, her translating heritage objects into digital or material digital compensations. As a citizen of a second world country, a Pole born and living in Warsaw, a city that was smashed into rubble during the World War II, I reconsidered the Warsaw Old Town after learning about the Syrian arch copy. Here, an artificial substitute of historic architecture was rebuilt and stands where it should be standing, in Warsaw. 
Meskel fairly argues that the symbolic site demonstrates human resilience to overcome the brutality of war. And by emphasizing my own standpoint and cultural background, I wish to ask for appropriate and ethical digital archaeology that is an effect of a meaningful, critical, reflexive studies and works that is addressed at local communities and their needs to identify with heritage that produces heritage understood as the interaction between people and the world and between people themselves. The witness of Syria's tragedies, Nur, uh, Nur uh, Munawar, writes while discussing if Palmyra should be rebuilt. The post-conflict reconstruction of Palmyra should uh, be in, in, uh, incorporated into the reconciliation of Syrian society with all its divisions, ethnicities, sectors, and religions. There is then no need for showcase ideological art Facts that serve to, serve to justify uh, the West elite being indifferent and passive about the war in Syria. Digital technologies and their implementation for the sake of heritage at risk should not be covered with flat symbols of ideology that send us directly back to imperialism and colonial narratives. There is no need for more imperial and exclusive fetishes of Western self-explanation when Palmyra and Syrian heritage have, el have already become the political battlefield now between the West and Russia. In December 2019, Russia officially confirmed the will to reconstruct the ancient site. The agreement was signed after the opening of the exhibition to Palmeiras, which in this political setting drew parallels between Palmyra and St. Petersburg. The arts ground tour and spatial political settings um, are circumstances under which the replica may be seen as failure given its mission to stand as an important gesture of friendship and solidarity with people, with people in the regions of conflict. Created and owned by the Western agendas, it recalls the long-standing Western ambition of possessing heritage. Could it have been different? Is it possible to rethink the Syrian art copy in a more affirmative context? If the replica was a well thought example of digital heritage, it could represent a nomadic type of planetary heritage. Objects like the copy of the Syrian arch are mobile, mobile and transferable. They can be placed everywhere as they are digital or material. As wandering heritage, they might be considered as parallel to the nomadic nature of contemporary social systems. Heritage moves when people are in motion. Does the copy of the arch while traveling and being settled, set in multiple locations could become a meaningful, agentive artifact of ideological discourse negotiated by different communities under the different spatiotemporal circumstances? Secondly, nomadic heritage as portable and movable is always a kind of translated heritage. It is always a result of specialist technological works. It might be fully digital or material digital, resembling and evoking the original, the real, so to say. The replica of the Syrian arch is an effect of data flows. Thus dynamism, flux, and transformation are its core affordances. Unlike precious musealia that hardly ever leave collections and storages, hybrid heritage is pre-designed to move. As in the case of the replica of the Syrian arch, it's, its most praised and discussed feature is its capability of being relocated and exhibited worldwide, mostly because it can be folded, packed and shipped. And even with the weight of 11 tons, it needs less legal permissions to travel than any other smaller artifact, sculpture or painting. Thirdly, nomadic heritage in the form of a digital or material object is of compensatory value. It replaces something that has been destroyed, decayed, or looted. Thus, its creation is always motivated by loss and absence, and, such, and as such, it generates its own mourning 
or are by situated social practices. All of those affirmative features of nomadic planetary heritage may be revealed only if an object, a product of technological flow, is a result of a profoundly reflexive practice, sensibility, engagement with local knowledge, subaltern agency, and cultural protocols. Otherwise, it may be yet another tool of technological oppression, exclusion or imperialism, especially having in mind that most of the world has still no funds to master technologies or to launch specialized digital labs and institutions. The meanings inscribed onto a hybrid compensatory heritage are of crucial importance for considering it as thoughtful and needful object of social identification. In the discussed case, heritage could have indeed the power to unite on more human, empathic level, not to divide in an imperial way as it did in result. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll be happy to hear comments, questions. Um, wow, thank you very much. That was, that was fantastic. <laughs> Appreciate. Uh, I, it gives us a lot to a lot to talk about. I, I guess I'm just going to stop the recording now.